Um, so thank you everyone for either coming here today or joining us online um, for our Knowing Your Athlete workshop. I'm really excited to be able to offer the Triathlon Queensland members um, this opportunity um, and hopefully we all have something to take away or have some things to think about post this workshop as well. Um, for those online, just a couple of housekeeping. Um, if you could all put your mics on mute for now, just so we don't get any background noise, uh, that would be great. Um, and when you want to contribute to the discussion, unmute and just say your name so we know who's talking as well. Um, if you do have any problems uh, online, if you just uh, use the message uh, option, uh, Nick will be able to help you uh, resolve those as well. Um, so, welcome, and I'd like to introduce you to Chelsea from Sports Site Queensland. Um, she has kindly given up some of her time and um, here to share some of her knowledge and experience, which is fantastic. Um, I might hand over to you just to give a bit, bit kick us off and give yeah. us a bit of background as to what you've done and um, Sports Site Queensland as well. Awesome, okay. thank you. Thanks. I'm a little bit nervous because I've never done anything like this before. It's kind of weird um, having a handful of people here and then the rest online, so I don't really know where I'm looking, but we'll roll with it. Um, yeah, I work at Sports Site Queensland, which is just around the corner in Paddington. So we work with a lot of different sports, um, individual athlete, client consultation kind of things, workshops like this um, within organisations as well. So. We've got a really cool team over there working within sports. I also do quite a bit in performing arts as well. So with um, ballet and musical theatre, which is a bit different. Um, they have a unique set of challenges, a bit different to athletes, but um, still very similar. Yeah, so I guess as sports psychologists at SPQ, we, I guess, are trying to get the best out of athletes from the mental side of sport, but it also kind of comes into team um, culture and stuff as well so obviously I know triathlons probably seen as an individual sport I was a swimmer everyone kind of thought swimming was an individual sport but it's very it's not like that it's a it's a team environment it's a squad um, that you're together and that's kind of part of it as well so sports psychologists we work with um, teams around culture values all that kind of stuff so that you've got a really great environment to get the best out of your athletes as well um, like I said, my background was swimming, so I was down in Melbourne with the Victoria Institute of Sport down there for a while. Um, had a bit of um, involvement with sports psychology and then just decided that was a really good way for me to kind of move forward in career. So hopefully I can share some knowledge with you guys. Has anyone in the room here had sports psychology involvement at all? A little bit? Perfect. So some of it might be like really familiar, something might be new. Um, I don't want it to be like a lecture. I normally have like a lot of small group discussion. Obviously today is a little bit different. Um, we'll see how we can roll with that. Um, get some involvement from you guys online as well. Um, yeah, so I guess we'll start rolling. I've got to figure out how to use this. Okay, we're all good. Um, so Kathy and I spoke, I think it was November or something yeah. last year, um, about some potential workshops. So at SPQ we've got, I think it's about six or seven workshops that we deliver to coaching groups that we kind of find as common areas um, or challenges as well when working as a coach. And the two that Cathy kind of picked out I thought went really well together. We sort of spoke about it and came up with the idea of going with today's topic which is knowing your athletes. Um, a guide to iGen adolescents. A lot of the coaching groups that we work with work with adolescents and those in their early 20s. I know when I spoke to Kathy, you guys, pretty broad range of ages. So for those in the room, can you share kind of what your age range is like in terms of who you coach? So I'm going to start with you. Five to 19. Five to 19, yeah. Um, 18 to 30. 18 to 30? 10 to 20. 10 to 20? 13 to 37 at the moment. Yeah, so pretty broad range. Um, and we'll talk a lot about how the brain is developing now in adolescence because I think it's very different to something like your 37 year olds that you would have completely different in how they're wired. So talking about that. Um, and then sort of building into squad culture because obviously with a broad range of athletes, it's a very unique kind of squad. Um, I think Kathy was mentioning some athletes have their parents in a squad as well, like it can be, very, very varied. Um, so I think being able to understand your athletes who you're working with, 
from that psychological side and then bringing it all together in terms of squad and how you can kind of mesh that and get the best out of everyone and yourself as a coach as well. So I think they go together quite nicely. In terms of what we'll cover today, the why. I think um, why it's important to know your athletes. So we'll discuss that a little bit as well. Um, and I want to hear some of your challenges. Obviously, you guys are the experts in this field and you know what you do very well. So I'd love to hear about your experiences and what the challenges are. And then some psychoeducation around the brain, um, some different theories, development, how you might be able to apply some of that stuff to your athletes. Um, Self-determination theory, has anyone heard of that? Probably heard of it, might be a nice review. Um, and then putting it all into practice. So I think um, this is sort of one of the first psych workshops we've had. Hopefully it's a nice base to, to then move forward with some other topics as well. I'm really open to questions, so please throw them at me. Um, yeah, I don't want this to be a lecture, so we'll all be involved in some way. Um, so we'll start. Why um, are we talking about this stuff? So what do we mean by knowing your athlete? So I'm going to open this up to the people online, and we'll see how this goes, and people in the room. What do we mean by knowing our athletes? So when I'm talking about this stuff, what am I kind of referring to? What do you think it is? Anyone? Don't be shy. Who are they? Who are they? Yeah. As a person, as an athlete? Both. Both. Yeah. Probably as a person first. As a person first, yeah. Any other ideas? Their goals or what they want to achieve? Yeah, absolutely. Knowing why they're there? Yeah. Is there anything particular about the athlete that you want to know? I've got some answers. I think there's a fair bit you can ask. Like yeah. Age. You know, sometimes we talk about weight. Yeah. Do they have any uh, food problems? Like if you travel a fair bit, food problems. Yeah. Um, we'll obviously need to know a lot about their, you know, obviously how much they can handle. Yeah. Um, have they had any previous coaches? What have the previous coaches had? Mm -hmm. Any problems? Um, yeah. <laughs> I think all really good and it depends on the kind of age of the athlete as well, what kind of questions you want to be asking. Some things, I guess, from that physical side of things where you work with physio, sports science, all of that, um, that's kind of taking the physical side of things into account. When psychologically, you were saying before, understanding how they cope under stress and pressure, obviously different ages are going to cope in different ways. Um, and stress and pressure in the tra training environment and also in the competition environment. So I know um, triathlons are always really full on. So most of most triathletes train every day. Is that right? So when I was swimming, I was like hanging out for a rest on a Sunday. And then we had a few triathletes that swam with us and they're like, oh no, we've got a run on Sunday. I was like, when do you rest? So it's quite full on. So knowing how they cope under pressure um, in both environments, understanding how they communicate as well. These are just a few things. I'm sure there's a lot more, but knowing how they communicate um, with you as a coach, but also with their teammates, um, with their peers when they're on competition day, all of that kind of stuff. Um, understanding how they manage themselves psychological, psychologically. So when they have nerves kick in or when they are under pressure or they're under a really heavy workload, what's their mindset like? How do they manage themselves to get the best out of themselves? Um, you know, routines, all that psych stuff that we do do a lot of so understanding them and knowing them and how they kind of function um, and understanding their psychological strengths and their areas for improvement as well so what are their strengths how can you use them more often um, and where are the areas that we can kind of work on to get the best out of themselves so that's knowing your athlete why is it important so that was kind of the what what we want to know why is it important to know this stuff from a psychological perspective or a mindset mental side of things knowing how to communicate yeah knowing how to communicate knowing how to coach you. yeah so why is that important i think everyone's different because everyone's everyone learns in a different way yeah everyone communicates in a different way yeah it's important to know on both sides so. Yes. Yeah. So what drives them, how to get the best out of them? Yeah. Any other ideas of why this stuff's important? <clears throat> For anyone at home as well, keep forgetting you're there. 
some ideas that I had as coach, um, I'm guessing there's a lot of planning that goes into it. Um, managing programs, managing athletes, knowing how your athletes respond um, makes your job a lot easier. Help manage the coach-athlete relationship effectively. So I think in any sport, you've probably got some strong personalities that respond in different ways as well. Um, just knowing how to work together as best you can. Um, to help um, improve performance outcomes. So again, in the training environment, you guys have a lot of goals. It's, is it a long season? How long are we talking? Is it like all the time? All the time, yeah. Um, so being able to work with that and perform consistently over a long period of time, like football has an on season and an off season, triathlon, swimming's the same. Um, there is no off switch, there's no off switch. So being able to be consistent with that. Um, athlete performance and coach performance. So I think coaches play a really key role because you guys are performing yourselves. So you're obviously wanting to get the best out of your athletes, but you yourself are actually performing. So if I reflect back to when I was swimming, but also in work that I do with coaches now, they actually, how they perform can really have a big influence over how the athlete performs. Um, coaches experience pressure, nerves, everything as well. So being able to manage yourself in that in that moment. Um, I've seen coaches, the pressure gets the better of them at like an Olympic trials or something where everyone's put everything on the line. And if coaches aren't holding it together, athletes are pretty intuitive, they pick up on that stuff. So um, I think that's a reason as to why it's important how to work together as well. Um, and building positive squad environment. So. I want to get a, a show of hands, I guess, or a bit of feedback. How many sessions do you train with a squad and how often are, are athletes kind of out doing their own thing? Any takers in the room? So I can get a bit of a picture. Well, I'm at a school, so right. most of the sessions, like they do do stuff by themselves, but yeah. the sessions are together. Together? Yeah. Yeah. How does uh, your kind of program work? I have an online program yeah. where I'm there sometimes, but a lot of them are on their own. Yes. And then I'm also with a, a daily environment with the squad that we turn up to every session. Yeah. But they might go for a four hour ride. We don't go for a four hour ride. Yes. But we're there every day to make sure you know, they know what they're doing. Yeah. And they go off to do the session. Yeah. So there's got to be a bit of trust there that they're going to go into what they need to do. Yeah. What about over here? I'll be 90, 10 squad individual. Yeah. So pretty varied in the room of like five people that we've got. What about yourself? Um, at the school that I was coaching at, everything all together, but at the um, club that I'm interning at, most of everything together, but then a few like home programs over the Christmas break to do. Yeah, like yeah. Help. Okay, cool. It's good for me to get an idea of what it kind of looks like, because obviously all coaches are going to have unique challenges within their group. Um, and trying to build a squad environment when you're nearly always online with one group or it's a lot harder than maybe when you've got a group that's together 90% of the time, um, which is kind of going to flow nicely into the next workshop where we're talking about squad culture and how we connect with people and how to get the best out of that group that you're working with as well. So this is going to be a group discussion and I'm going to get you guys to kind of move together. For those of you online, maybe a bit of reflection, writing down some ideas, because I'd love to hear from you. Um, what are some of the challenges that you've experienced as a coach when working with athletes? So whether that's from five to 19 to 37 year olds, to having very different um, models of coaching, with different age groups, um, some of the challenges. So I'm gonna get you guys to kind of sit together and have a chat, and I'm gonna give you a couple of minutes just to throw some ideas out there and tune into these people online. Go ahead. I'd love to hear. <laughs> well, you're back in out of the <laughs> Kathy and Emma might know from watching or working within the space. Are we just calling them out to you? Or well, I was going to say you guys can have a couple of minutes, but you can just call them out if you want. I find, I find working with teenage girls can be extremely hard. Yep. Because once they're best friends and the next day they're <laughs> at each other. Yes. It's like, 
Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. That, I find that quite difficult sometimes. Yeah. So managing the like friendship groups within yeah, the squad. Within the squad. Yeah. This person doesn't like this person, but the next day they're best friends, sort of thing. Yeah. Like, so trying to keep up with what's going on. Yeah. There. Yeah. And how does that influence the group? So if you've got all these kind of like different dynamics going on. Well, you've got some kids that couldn't care less what yeah. happens over here, but then other kids get drawn into what the friendship groups and yeah. I'm really good friends with this person. But I go to school with this person and it's like some kids. Conflicting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. You, you were going to say something as well? I have the inverse challenge. Yeah. With boys. Right. Um, so when you're standing on the pool deck, yeah. With any boy between the age of 12 and 16, mm -hmm. you need to give the instruction four different times in four different ways. Yes. <laughs> so the processing of it, the information Mate, isn't always boys, super clear. But I um, am fortunate. I'm quite good with girls because I've had two of my own. They're 20 yeah. and 18. But yeah. <laughs> uh, then went from that to starting to coach 12-year-old boys three, four years ago. And my God, what a, what a difference that was. Yeah. Learned, learned a lot. But very different, just the way adolescent males and females receive and process information is vastly different. Yes. They have to cater for that when you have a mixed group. Yeah, absolutely. And that's kind of knowing knowing your athletes as well. So are you working at a girls' school or is it a co-ed school? It's a co-ed school, but yeah. there's a, quite a few girls in the group. Yeah. But we've got a few boys, which I have to hear what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you've seen that side as well? I've seen that side. We don't have yeah. as many, so it doesn't make <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah, absolutely. In terms of how they process, I think maturity as well. All those girls are pretty mature in a different way. Um, yeah. We've got a couple of uh, message from Stu online yeah. who said working with athletes in remote locations. Yeah, right. In Queensland. Yeah. Um, he's also said uh, working with um, athletes with uh, and their timing for so everyone's racing different races. So yes. trying to adapt to their racing seasons. Yeah. Challenge. So I'm guessing like different tapers, everyone's on a different schedule, trying to manage that within yeah. a group of people. And Simon's also contributed experience. Yeah. One. Experience in terms of everything, training, performing. Yeah. Any other challenges? Um, I've found that with some of the older athletes in the squad that I'm working with, as I am the lowly intern mm -hmm. it's not so much if I tell him to do something it's probably not going to happen so it's kind of communicating but making it seem like a discussion as in it's their decision what they want to do yes instead of being this is what I actually need you to do yeah pretend that you have options so making it as if it's their idea yes yeah good one that'll kind of come into self-determination theory I think too in terms of decision making and autonomy and and Older adults do like that because they've got the life experience and they have a certain way of doing things. So yeah, so that's your challenge. It's nice to hear the differences because we've got like school and adolescence and then the older age group as well. Was there any challenges that you had before? Um, I reckon so true. I reckon the, um, just from a growing perspective, um, the different levels of like self-motivation like not everyone's there to win the Olympics yes. so it's balancing their individual goals so they still get the best out of themselves yeah which is not necessarily easy no absolutely and I think that's why it's so important to know your athlete in terms of getting the best out of them knowing what their purpose is yeah. and why they are there across all different sports if you're pushing and pushing and pushing someone who doesn't always necessarily want to win you're almost like pushing them away or out of the sport or out of your group or whatever that may be. So really knowing their why, I think is good. Kathy's good. Um, Nathan has posted um, working with athletes, so the ones that are remote who don't have access to all the equipment and facilities like pools. Yeah, yeah. And how do you get around that? That's really, that's a tricky one. Yeah. You were going to say something? I was just going to say, um Making sure athletes don't overdo it when they're at a younger age. Like yes. making sure like not every session is uh, a race. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think the young athletes actually think that the harder you go, the better you're going to be. Yeah. So yeah. It's not actually true. Yeah. Especially the boys. Yes, yeah. that competitive. <laughs> I, think yeah. the, I think the girls are very competitive. Yeah. As well as the boys. The girls are always trying to keep up with the boys as long as they can. Yeah, right. And 
maybe that's not good for them. You know, they've got to run their own pace or run their own pace, not actually yeah. train with the boys all the time. Yeah, sometimes it, it is that idea like you push yourself until you, you throw up every session or whatever it is. It's like if I'm doing that, that's the best, but there's kind of you're not actually getting the recovery and stuff that you need as well. I think mentally and physically recovery. Um, any other challenges that you guys have experienced with athletes? Um, not sort of the athletes, but it's the parents wanting the athletes to do more. Yes. And more, 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 more is not always better. No. Not believing in the coach. Yes. Okay. So I did my masters in parents, um, parents in sport and pressure and everything like that. From just a pure observation point of view, when I was swimming, um, a lot of parents that were quite full on, their kid would drop out by sixteen because it's just too much. Yeah. Experience similar kind of thing. Um, parents are really tricky because kids go home to their parents and that's the environment that they're around all the time and I find the same in work you know when I work with individual clients we can work on all these positive things in terms of you know managing stuff but then they go home to their parent and the parent is with them all the time so that is a really tricky one and it's another workshop I think in our series that we have isn't around managing parents um, because they are a challenge big time anything else that you guys have I think it's good to talk about this stuff because you all experience similarities, but also differences within the space. Anything else that you can come up with? Um, perhaps some difficulties when you go into a sport where you have not actually experienced it yourself, mm -hmm. and may or like come in as a S and C role, but don't have the technical um, yeah. knowledge behind it. Trying to build that trust that you actually know what you're doing yeah. can be a little difficult for the first. It. It's almost like you've got to get some cred, like credibility with them. Do you find it's the older athletes or the younger, or is it kind of across the board? Across the board. Yeah. Really. Yeah. Perhaps more the older male. Yeah. Demographic. Yeah. <laughs> so you've really got to show your worth and your your knowledge and build that trust. You said trust. I think that's a huge one, particularly when working with adults as well. Was there anything else online at all, Cathy? No? All right, I think group discussion went smoother than I thought with online, so that's good. Um, like I said, I think it is good to have these conversations because you all do experience um, similar challenges, but also different challenges depending on the age group and the, you know, the demographic of the people that you work with. Hopefully today, some of the information will be able to help you and give you some practical strategies that you can apply with your demographic or your group. We will have a bit on adolescence and the brain and how it's working at the moment um, because it sounds like a lot of you are in that space. Um, I don't want to get super technical, but I think in terms of the brain and how it works, particularly as we are going to talk about adolescence and neuroscience, so really basic slide, but the brain is pretty much just like a connected power grid of all these neurons. So these neurons connect in your brain um, with trillions of connections. So whenever we say anything, whenever we think something, when we bring up a memory, when we perform a certain action, these neurons wire together for that to be able to happen. So, you know, when you think, when you sit in a chair and your thought process goes from one thing to another within 20 seconds, it's all these neural pathways um, that are connecting in different ways to activate that thought that comes up. So it's the same thing that happens with um, body movement. So you've got athletes that are moving their bodies. Um, you hear muscle memory, it's all sort of starting in the brain in terms of how those connections wire together. So like I've said there, thoughts, feelings, actions, anything, it's all starting in the brain with these um, neural connections. Now I had a video, this is the joys of technology. Um, what I might do is send the link to Kathy. Um, it's like a two minute YouTube video, but it wouldn't work in this format. So it's about neuroplasticity. So does anyone know what it is? Any ideas or? It's a big word. No? No ideas? Um, so neuroplasticity is about how the brain is wired and basically that the brain seen as malleable. So when you're working with adolescents, you actually, their brain's developing at a much quicker rate 
Um, and it's a lot easier to change than some of your older athletes that you're working with. They're pretty fixed in their mindset and their ways of doing things. So neuroplasticity is basically within this um, brain connected power grid that we have of these, um, I think that's whiteboard marker, um, these pathways that we have in our brain, they're, they connect. So has anyone heard the things that fire together, wire together? So it's the same thing, it's in the brain. So if you have, I guess, two thoughts that connect cons consistently, what ends up happening is this pathway becomes really, really well traveled. Okay, so the brain is great, but it's, it's very lazy and it'll take the quickest option ever. So if we wanna create, you know, I'm going psychology terms in, in, in the ways that we think about things. Unhelpful thoughts, for example, they become really well wired. So if you've got an athlete that has got this self-doubt about them or something, I'm not good enough, that pathway can become so well-traveled and it's just easy. I get into um, race mode and I get up there and that brain is just gonna go straight here, I'm not good enough because that, that pathway is so well-traveled. But we can change it. Does that make sense what I'm going with so far? The brain does have the ability to shift and change. So it's about being able to connect these new pathways to maybe a more helpful thought. And so this ends up becoming more well-traveled. It travels easier and this one kind of fades away. So I'm using the example with a thought in terms of how we think about things, but any of those neural pathways in your brain, whether it's an action, a thought, a feeling, um, how you look at something, whatever it may be, we're actually able to change the brain. So it was thought that that wasn't possible. It, it is, as an adult, we still can do it. It's a lot harder as an adult though. So working with adolescents and younger kids as well, you have the ability to kind of really shape them and, and be a big influence on them, which is no pressure. But um, yeah, being able to just understand that that's part of what's kind of going on for them. Does that make sense? Is there any questions about that? This is why a two minute video is a lot easier to explain what I'm talking about. All good online. So in terms of the brain and this neuroplasticity that we're talking about, um, we are able to change it. But if we think about the generation of kids or athletes or teenagers that are coming through, their brain is wired completely different to some of your 37 year old athletes. Okay, so they've, you know, I guess if you've coached them um, over a period of time, you see the differences in the, the athletes coming through. Adolescent brain, there's hardly any delayed gratification with adolescents. With kids nowadays, everything is instant. Um, and that's how the brain becomes wired. It's so fixed that anything that I want or I need to know is really easily traveled. So everything is instant. So when I was at school, if I wanted to know some random fact, I had to go to the library and look it up in a book. Now it's like Google. Um, anything else, like everything's instant. If I'm feeling lonely, I'll um, put something out on Facebook and hopefully I'll get something and it's instant. So I get that feeling. And so everything at the moment now with these kids coming through, their brain is wired so differently to the generation before. Um, a lot of coaches that I've spoken to that have been coaching for a long period of time have noticed in the last five years the difference in terms of coaching athletes. So some of the swimming coaches that I've spoken to, so swimming's pretty taxing. It's, you know, eight, nine sessions a week from a young age. They've seen that they have to have like some cherry, some carrot that's there to kind of motivate them to get through a session. Um, whereas, you know, five, ten years ago, athletes were pretty self-motivated. They were willing to put in the work because they know if you go through these sessions, it's kind of, you get to the end point. But now it's like, I need to get there now. Like, why can't I just be good now? Does that kind of make sense? Have any of you noticed that if you've been coaching for a while in terms of a change? What have you sort of seen in your athletes you've worked with? Well, I think what you said just before it's just like back in the day I think well, I don't know if I'm on the right path but I think back in the day you used to work harder and athletes wanted to work harder yeah but these days I feel like not all of them are out there you know they're happy just to go through the motions mm. it doesn't actually mean like 
they're not happy. They don't want to put the work in. They're more happy just to turn up, go home. Yeah, just mundane. Yeah. Have any uh, else of you noticed anything similar in terms of changes? You work in a school. Yeah, they're addicted to phones. Yes. So they want to get out to get on their phone. Yeah. yeah. Same thing. Yeah. It's yeah. Insane. Whereas back in the day, it was you turned up and then you sat around for half an hour after the session just talking. Yeah. They don't really. No. Some do, but others are yeah. addicted to technology. Yeah. And I think, yeah, the technology thing is a big part of it. Kathy's got a hand up at the back. Um, Simon says uh, athletes seem to be lazier these days. It's all about being in the group photo or on social media. To yeah and it's the same you know social media is great because you know and technology like we're able to run a workshop in this forum there's a lot of positives to it but in terms of that adolescent brain and that generation coming through they are wide in that way where um it's all immediate there's so many distractions there's everything going on there's this need for impulsivity like i've got up there the want for instant reward um, and there's just so much information at them all the time. So you scroll your Facebook feed or your Instagram feed, it's just stuff coming at you all the time. It's so taxing on the, the brain and how it processes information as well. Um, so again, this is where it's kind of knowing your athletes. If you're working with a wide range of athletes, in terms of age, you've got an older group that's maybe not this way inclined, whereas a younger group, it's like, how can I make this exciting? I've had swimming coaches, like I have to come up with with games or some challenge or whatever it is to kind of get them in because that's how they're wired. So knowing that, um, adolescence too, it's like the crucial time for brain development. So they've got all this information coming through, but you've also got this neuroplasticity stuff. They're very malleable. They're very easily influenced um, by the information that they get. And you've probably seen with peers as well, um, parents lots of different stuff coming at them so it's hard for them to make sense of a lot of what's going on so they just kind of roll with it sometimes um i think life transitions as well so i spoke before about that i i've noticed 16 to 18 i'm not sure what the research is but it's kind of a crucial time in terms of dropout not only do you have this you know need for immediacy um oh, i've got to put in all the work i've got to do all this stuff but i've also got my friends i've got uni what am I going to do with my life? All of this, this other pressure. There's so much going on in that brain that to kind of process it all is a really hard task. So the same in females and males at age? Pretty similar. They're, obviously, they've got the differences in terms of maturity. Girls tend to mature a little bit earlier, but there's still, males and females still have all this stuff going on, all these influences. Um, have you noticed a difference in males and females? No, I was just asking. Yeah? No, I was just wondering because obviously with, Maturity, what boys very uh, distracted? So, a uh, majority of my squad would be approaching that's that um, boys would be approaching <clears throat> that 16. Yeah. I've only got two really over that. Mm -hmm. um, and they're both pretty focused. Yeah. Um, lucky there, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, but isn't it really like the distraction? It's like when you get to 18, you can start partying and drinking and stuff 100%. like that. So, yeah. You see what other people do, like influence, like your other mates are going out drinking while you're out doing a training session. Yeah, you sacrifice that's a lot of things. That's a difference at that age. Yeah, absolutely. So as a coach, knowing that there's that stuff out there as well, it's like, how do you balance that? I know some of my coaches, you see it really angry at anyone that went out on the weekend, but that's also a time to socialise as well. Like it's kind of having that balance and being understanding as a coach, whereas if you're kind of pushing them, pushing them away, that's when there's a bit of dropout as well. It's like, why, why am I doing this when all my other friends are having this much fun and I, you know, I can't be a part of that. So there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, I don't know, to me, it sounds like coaching adolescents, it would be incredibly hard. How, how do you guys find it in terms of age difference? Obviously different challenges each age group, but how is it coaching adolescents? I enjoy it. You enjoy it? Yeah. It's <laughs> Energizing. I yeah, I find yeah. energizing. Yeah. yeah. If you keep it fun and, and like the sessions will still be hard. Yeah. But if you try and have a bit of fun with them too, yes. I find you'll get more out of them. But if it's just like 
you got to do this and this and this and all serious. Or yeah. You've lost them for the day. Yeah, absolutely. You want to say something? Yeah. I'll, <laughs> I'll go to the front and then go. Um, I found both enjoyable but also kind of a little bit extra difficult when you are a young coach. Yeah. Having to coach kids who are only two, three years younger than you. Yeah. As you're like still developing yourself, mm -hmm. having to then coach a developing person. Yes. Kind of throws a bit of a curveball into it. Yeah, absolutely. Just trying to manage them, get trust it from them or yeah like having yeah. them especially if it's at like if in a school environment and you've actually been at the same school while they were still a student yeah that, and also then having their parents know you mm -hmm. as a school student and then yes. having to create a kind of different relationship with them yeah and then also manage yourself yeah to actually get through the season yes or competition absolutely it is it's that it's like your own life transition and then you're kind of transitioning into a coach in that role and then seeing you in a different light. That's another challenge when working with adolescents as a young coach. Um, down the back there, something as well. Yeah. Um, so just being aware of that stuff I think is really important. Knowing what they're kind of going through, trying to meet them at their level as well. Sometimes that's really hard. Um, I probably work mostly with adolescents myself and can be really great if you've got them on board and you've got that trust there and there's that openness and then there's the others that have got walls up and that's also a challenge. Um, so you're just keeping that in mind in terms of your training and how you're responding to them and that level of understanding. So we're kind of, that will sort of flow through this workshop. Um, has anyone heard of Simon Sinek? So he talks about the why. Um, a lot of the times we're very good at um, talking about the what and the how, but we don't actually connect with the why, which actually drives pretty much everything that we do. I'll send through to Kathy as well um, a really good TED talk on this because I think in terms of knowing, knowing your athlete, <clears throat> you need to be able to connect with their why, but also why you're coaching yourself um, in terms of building that relationship with them. So I'm going to put you all on the spot in the room and people at home as well. If we're talking about yourselves as a coach, why do you coach? Why do you do what you do? I enjoy it. You enjoy it? Yeah. Yeah? The passion for helping others. Yeah, thank you. I yeah. do it to help young people become the best people they can be. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes, agree. Yeah. yeah. Anything from online? Um, love to give back to the sport. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, Sunny. Um, Nathan, uh, the sport as well, and to grow and see athletes and students grow and achieve their goals. Yeah, great. So that being part of that process and that development, um, like we're saying with these these adolescents and the, the brain, you guys have a really big influence over their lives. Um, I don't know if you've gone through sport yourselves. You look back at coaches. One of my coaches is still a mentor to me now. So. You do play a really big role, so just asking you what your why is, but in terms of knowing your athletes, knowing their why, Emma was kind of speaking before about why do they show up? Why they, Is it because their parents want them to? Do you have parents that just want them to be there and that's the only reason? Yeah, so managing that's not easy. Um, why do they do what they want to do? Why are you coaching? So that drives everything. So if you know the why, you then know the how and the what. That's a lot easier. Um, as well. So Simon Sinek does a lot of work on this in terms of motivation and also um, yeah, just planning things, reflecting um, on your why you process your own kind of stuff as well. Um, again, knowing athletes. Has anyone seen the stages of change model? Pretty familiar. From a psychological perspective, knowing where your athletes are on this kind of wheel, I guess. Um, when I was sort of putting this up, I'm thinking stages of change is sort of related to anything that you do, whether that's wanting to lose weight, whether that's wanting to quit smoking, whether that's changing um, a training pattern, whether that's changing technique, um, changing schedule of the season, any kind of behavior change sort of goes through this sort of model. Um, sort of start up the top with 
pre-contemplative, so you guys have probably had athletes that are in this stage where there's no intention of changing. Um, so you might put to them, you know, we, we want to change a technique in some way. So if I'm, I'm kind of reflecting on swimming, which is good because you guys are familiar with swimming, um, wanting to change a technique, you know, your brain is so well wired to work in a certain way and it, it's comfortable, it's easy. Why would I want to change it? I don't want to make any changes. It's that pre-contemplative. Knowing your athletes there, it's kind of like, okay, that's what I'm working with. How can I get them to the next stage? Um, so it's almost like knowing that they're there, but what can I do to get them to the next point? So if you're kind of reflecting on your own athletes, have you got an example of where you've had an athlete who's been pre-contemplative? They're like, no, I don't think that's a really good idea. Or I'm not open to that at all. Any thoughts of an athlete? I can think of a time when I, as an athlete, were pre-contemplative and it was in relation to um, technique change or something like that, or, oh, you should start doing more morning training or something like that. Let's train, change training to 4.30 in the morning instead of 5.30. I'm not okay with that. Any other ideas of um, <laughs> where you've had an athlete? When an athlete thinks about changing coaches. Right, tell me a little bit more about that. You start questioning, is it worth you being there? Yeah. Or is the training what you're doing correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, so you can start to doubt yourself a little bit. Yeah, yeah. you start to doubt the coach too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So pre contemplative, not quite sure. Um, then you kind of like move into contemplative, which is the next sort of stage where you kind of like there's a problem there, whether that's coach or environment or yeah, maybe my technique's not great or my training schedule isn't good or I'm not managing my recovery well, whatever it may be. Um, you're aware of it, but there's no commitment to action. You're kind of like, yeah, it could be good, but I'm not quite ready to make that change. So knowing that an athlete is there, any examples that you can think of when you've had an athlete that's like, or yourself as a coach, in terms of making a change? Yeah? Having um, perhaps the person in the team or the crew that isn't the most motivated and knowing that they need to pick up their attitude yeah. but not actually following through with it. So mm -hmm. like having a discussion with them, these are the things I've noticed. Yeah. And then being like, oh yeah, okay, but not following through with the plan or yeah. doing really anything. So a lot of talk and not much action. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, they and I reflect myself, we all do it in different times. Um you know what you've got to do. Okay, I know I need to eat healthy, but I don't always put that into action. Um, so knowing that your athletes there, okay, how can I get them to that preparation or planning stage to kind of move towards action? So connecting with their why, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, but also sharing information as to why this might be beneficial. It's almost like a bit of motivational interviewing, saying what are the pros and cons of making a change and not making a change? Um, and having that conversation with them. I don't know how much time you get one-on-one -on -one with your athletes, but seeing where they're at and how can we move forward, even showing them this kind of plan, you can all kind of relate to it in some way. Um, the next stage is preparation or, or planning. So there's an intent to take action. So you've kind of moved on from contemplation, and really kind of put it into practice. Um, any examples you can think of, of athletes or, you know, what do you do as a coach in that stage? I feel like it's a little bit more self-explanatory than some of the others, but. Might be putting a session plan together or um, a plan for the year, you're sort of planning for how I'm gonna make a change. Okay, we used to swim in the mornings, we're gonna to plan to change. You can swim in the afternoons or something like that. So planning, basically. Um, <laughs> Moving on to action, which is again self-explanatory. Okay, we've thought about this stuff, we've planned about how we're gonna execute it, how we're gonna put it into action. So with your athletes, sitting down with them as well, giving them a bit of ownership, how we're gonna make this stuff happen. And then maintenance. So like with anything, you can kind of maintain it and it's all really good. It's learning, it's growth, it's, it's positive, And then you tend to move into a bit of a lapse. Okay, and when, it's sort of how you frame that lapse because I think any time you, you change anything, there's going to be this process. Whether that's, um, you know, wanting to lose weight, you're like, you have a great week and then you get to Friday night and you're like, 
you know, maybe too much wine, take out whatever, you're kind of like, oh, I've, I've lapsed here, but, you know, where you've actually had five days that are really good. So how you frame that, that lapse in terms of this process, um, it says in the middle, you're sort of upward sm um, spiraling, you're learning from each experience that you have. So if you've got an athlete that's putting this technique change into place, for example, um, they might be able to maintain it really well through training, but then when they hit fatigue, that's when that lapse comes in or in terms of how they, you know, prepare psychologically. They manage their nerves really well, but then it kind of, there's, there's some experience, they're up against a certain athlete and they have a bit of a lapse. Does that kind of make sense with what I'm saying? So being able to talk them through and knowing your athlete and how they respond to those lapses that they have, whatever it may be, I think is really key. Um, because we work, we do, with our brain and how it's wired, it's very easy to fall back into those patterns that are there that are so easily traveled in the brain um, that it's easy to kind of flip back, whether it's under pressure, under fatigue, um, new environment, whatever it may be. So yeah, really framing that in a positive way that this is all part of the process. The more that you lapse, the more you're learning. Um, it's a bit of that growth mindset stuff too, but being able to really connect with that and go, okay, let's get back on track. And we're kind of rewiring our brain in that process to create more helpful habits, more helpful ways of doing things. Does anyone have any questions about anything so far at all? Um, Self-determination theory. So a lot of you have heard of it. Um, it's probably one of the biggest theories of motivation, I think. This is again linking to knowing your athletes, how are you getting the best out of them? Um, when I ask you why you coach, it's you know to help because you enjoy it, but also to help people develop and get the best out of themselves, um, to motivate them, to perform at their best. You wanna be part of that process. So part of that is, as a coach, is being able to motivate your athletes. Um, so self-determination theory is basically a theory of motivation. I haven't quite written this slide very well. I just looked over it before I'm like, just a few points, but um, it's been regularly applied to sport and performance settings. So um, it's based on the human needs. So you've got your hierarchy of needs and stuff like that, but we'll go into a bit more detail, but it's based on what we as human beings, as people, we said before that working with athletes, knowing them as a person, but also as an athlete, knowing what they need and how to connect with that to get the best out of them. Um, it's based on three core principles, which we'll go through in a minute. Um, and it helps people become intrinsically motivated. So, you know, the external stuff's really good. I want to make my coach happy or I want to get the outcome or whatever. But again, the intrinsic stuff there, why, why are they doing what they're doing um, and how can we connect with that to motivate them and get the best performance outcomes. And for yourself as coaches, so thinking about this for your own development. So the three core principles that make up self-determination theory are autonomy, competence, and relatedness. So we'll break these down in a little bit more detail. But if you're thinking about your athletes, regardless of age, how you can maybe apply some of these um, principles with them. So I know the screen's a little bit fuzzy for you guys in the room. <clears throat> so autonomy is about behavior that's congruent with the self. So what what is important to you? Um, so being able to have control over choices and decision-making processes. Um, depending on age, obviously, there's gonna be different levels of autonomy. If you're working with five-year-olds, they don't have a lot of autonomy. They're kind of dictated by their parents. Um, but in that adolescent phase, they're kind of going through that identity change as well, trying to figure out who they are. So a lot of the time in that 14 to 18 years, they're sort of challenging you know, values that they've been up, brought up with in terms of their parents or their coaches, they're trying to like, that's probably why teenagers, there's so much angst. They're trying to figure out who they are and they don't always agree with what other people are telling them. Um, giving them some autonomy is really important in terms of helping them develop their own identity and, and have some control over what they're doing. Um, and when you're autonomous, you're wholeheartedly behind what you're doing. You're not just doing it because mum's telling you to do it. I think that might play into the reason why there's quite a bit of dropout in that 16 to 18 years. It's like, well, mum's kind of pushed me to do this the whole time. I'm making my own decisions. I'm figuring out who I want to be, why I'm doing what I'm doing, and why would I want to get up and train every day. Um, competence is being good at what you do. So that sense of um, 
mastery. So having the right skill set, you obviously feel more confident. So the more that you you do something, the more you create these patterns in your brain, the more confident that you are to be able to execute them at the right time, whether that's in the training environment or competition environment as well. Um, and the last one I think is really nice because it will sort of flow into the next workshop that we have in terms of relatedness. So feeling cared for and connected to others. So as human beings, we're actually social beings. We like this sense of belonging. There's a lot of research out at the moment around loneliness. And they say that loneliness will be the death of someone before something like heart disease or anything like that. So we like to be a part of something, whatever that is, um, in terms of well-being, but in terms of performance as well. Um, that connection, so connection as a coach with your athletes, but your athletes being connected to you as well. Um, yeah, sense of belonging and culture. Culture's this this big thing, everyone talks about it, but it's like, how do you get it? How do you get this culture that everyone wants to be a part of where there's always these great outcomes and everyone's loved and feels a, a part of something? You see the best teams often have a great culture. Um, and I think being more connected to what you do in terms of athletes being connected to what they do, but also yourself as a coach. How do you connect with what you do, you do to be motivated by what you do? Um, it's really easy to go through the motions and I'm guessing you guys have pretty heavy schedules as well. Um, okay, how do I re-motivate myself? How do I connect with the, any of these things as we go through? So if we look at autonomy, and I'm going to have a bit of group discussion here as well, so we can either talk or we can just throw out ideas. Um, again, going back to autonomy, it's that sense of control over choices, decision making, it's congruent with your why, connecting with your why. Um, if you're thinking about working with your athletes and knowing them and wanting to get the best out of them, what are some practical strategies that you might be able to put in place to be able to connect with this, this principle of autonomy? So thinking about how you work with, obviously some of you have athletes that really need to be autonomous. Um, they have a lot of control over what they do and when because they're quite rural. Um, any ideas from adolescents through to middle-aged? What are some things? I that... get my better adolescent athletes involved with their programming. Right. I know that's an obvious statement. No. Um, but what I mean by that is it's a discussion around, I'll set the program. Yeah. And then there's a discussion with them around how that fits what we're trying to achieve. Yes. And I'll take their input. Yeah. As a 14 year old, I'll take a 14 year old's input mm -hmm. into what they feel they might want to insert, change, or move around in their program and why. Yeah. From 14 through 18. Yeah. I think that's really important too because it gives them ownership over it as well. So they're more motivated because they they feel like they've had to say you're building that coach athlete relationship as well. I kind of found that some of these boys I've been with from 10, 11, mm -hmm. they're now 14, 15, 16. Yeah. Um, so they're ready to. They they're not boys that need to be told how to train anymore. You know, yeah. they need to be told that's what you have to do. Mm -hmm. They're they're boys that need to contribute to their own development. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and their program is part of that. Yeah. And I think in terms of working with, I think it's really good because it is, it's allowing them to have ownership and, and be motivated by it. But adolescents, particularly now, I think even more so, they are often told what to do. I found a lot of schools, it's like everything's spoon fed, everything's given to them. They're told, like, I've seen parents pick up their bags for their kid, like their teenage kids, like, everything's given to them. This is almost like a process of being able to allow them to think for themselves as well in terms of learning and problem solving, um, changing that brain, having to think for themselves as well. So I think that's a really positive um, move and something that, yeah, if you haven't done, I think it, it just opens that dialogue as well between coach and athlete, um, which is always a positive thing. Any other ideas of what you already do or what you can do to put this stuff into play? always asking them what they think, like finishing a set piece and yeah. just being like, how did it go? What did you think? Yes. And kind of getting them to realise that while you're sitting over here looking at something, it's very different from when they're actually doing it. Yeah. Um, and 
So I did that a lot of, in a school environment, but then went to a club and looking at learning a new skill with someone then immediately looking at me for feedback. Yes. And that was a bit scary with kind of having 13 year olds say straight away, this is what we did good, this is what we need to do better, this is how we're gonna do it. Yeah. But then to have 22, 24 year olds kind of a bit lost. Yeah. And then saying, okay, what did you think? And just yeah. a minute of silence. Yeah. What thought about it. I'm not quite sure. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's um, what you said before, it's what I do with a lot of athletes. It sounds like someone's been involved there in terms of good, better, how getting them to kind of reflect before you give them feedback, I think gives them autonomy. It makes them reflect on what they're doing, process, be aware, first of all, like more than anything, um, and make them take ownership over it, make them be motivated by it. And then you, again, that, that coach athlete dialogue is kind of working as well. Um, any other ideas or things that you guys do? Anyone online? I find just talking, like creating a conversation and then you can work training into that. Yeah. So just talking about just general stuff. Yes. It doesn't have to be after, or like before training. Yeah. Creating general chat and that'll open up or yeah. something, something that happened at home. Or, yeah. Yeah. Just, just talking to them. Because they're, they're a person taking yeah. interest outside of that and it's almost creating that space where they feel comfortable. Yeah to talk about stuff and to be open and throw out stuff and be a little bit more autonomous, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, some of the things that I kind of recommend is is letting them have ownership over their program or sitting down and having that conversation with them. What can they choose? Obviously you're the coach and you've got the knowledge and you, you've got an idea of what you want to put in play, but how can they be involved in that process? And I think even just communicating that with them, I think, kids, adolescents, just us as humans, we're generally pretty curious and we want to know again that why, why am I doing what I'm doing? So um, talking to them about that, they feel part of the process. A lot of the time if it's getting to training, regardless of age, it's just this, this is what we're doing or we're just doing it for the hell of doing it or what's the purpose behind it, um, letting them feel part of that process and the decision making as well. Um, Competence is that, like we said, that sense of mastery. So whenever you're starting something out that is, is new or different and you're not as confident in it, you tend to not be as, well, some people are not as motivated by it. Um, but basically this competence is being able to be confident in your ability. You can go out and perform how you need to perform. Um, obviously your athletes know how to run, ride a bike and swim, but are they confident to be able to put this new technique into play in a competition environment. Um, so thinking about um, knowing your athletes, what are some practical strategies that you can put into place to connect with that idea of competence? So any, like I've got some ideas, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on what you do already or what maybe is something that you've thought about putting into practice. Constructive, constructive feedback instead of just this is what you did wrong, this is what you did right, and this is what you did correct, and this is why you did it. Yeah. So this is how you can do it again, or this is you're on the right track. This is how you can improve it instead of just being very yeah. Fucking well with it. Yeah. That the positive stuff and the why again the why you changed it why it was good all of that stuff. Um, the performing arts space that I work in is very different to sport um, in that I've got ballet dancers that stand in front of a mirror and they are critiqued non-stop and it's almost like their level of confidence and ability to perform and do what they need to do is sometimes shot because it's just like there's nothing positive, there's no positive feedback whatsoever. It's like you've done that wrong, that wrong, that wrong, that wrong and uh, you know you don't look good doing it because it's like their body is like, you know, what they perform with. Um, so I think, yeah, being able to feed that back and why it was good and, and that positive feedback with them, it's kind of like if we don't get feedback on it, we assume that we're doing it well, um, which is not super healthy. Um, and something that we're working to give positive feedback. No, not always. But I think it's, it's how you give it. So in that instance, like there's no positive feedback. 
I don't think it's always got to be positive. I think it's got to be framed in a in a helpful way. Um, yeah. What What are your kind of thoughts? Well, I mean, like for a younger athlete, I think it's good to be positive mm. and also good to give feedback if they can do things different. But I think with older athletes, more advanced athletes, you don't have to comment. Yeah. Most of the time. Yeah. Like they're there to do a job. That's their job. Mm hmm. Sometimes when they go for a, a run with hills, I don't need to say good work. Yeah, yeah. Or yeah. They go for a long ride, I don't need to say good work for getting that done. Yeah. Maybe as a junior athlete, you know, yeah. you might need to do that more. Yeah, absolutely. You know, like I do with juniors, which is getting back to your previous slide around mm. immediate gratification. Yes. Yeah, they need something. Yeah, and that's knowing your athletes and knowing the group. And sometimes it can be really tricky if you've got. 13 year olds and 20 year olds in the same group um, in terms of their just general development but also the way their brain is wired it's like having to play with that and when you've got older athletes you don't have to tell them good run um, it doesn't always have to be positive uh, feedback it can be around yeah good better how I think is a really good way to do it um, with is there also value with a younger athlete you've got them in the pool you're trying a technique them, um, you give them an instruction, they process it and they do it, mm -hmm. so they've shown confidence, yep. and then rewarding immediately. Yes. And it's not a big reward, it's mm -hmm. just a, yeah, you did exactly with that, yep. and then you connect that with that, Yes. you connect the feeling yep. with, with the right competency, yeah, uh, and give the reward right at that particular point. Yeah. It's that immediacy. Not, not all the time, and I've yeah. got to do it, but, yeah. but that getting that connection, does yeah. that work? Yes. Right. It's, a, it's a way. Like, obviously, you're not going to do it every single time, but it's like it's that constant feedback stream. And I think with adolescents, you need it, and particularly the way their brain is wired now, I think it is good to be immediate. Right. Do, you think, do you think athletes search for that? Like, like they always want to do more Some and more and more do. to get to that point where you're always going, oh, good, good work today, good work today. Yeah. Some athletes probably do, yeah. So it, it, it is a, it's a balance. It's not like if they've done a technique change and then they've kind of, you know, they've got into that maintenance phase of changing that behaviour, you're probably not going to have to do that all the time. It's kind of picking the times of when we're actually making change here. It's not like you need positive every single lap, every single session, good, good, good. It's kind of picking the times of when you do that as well, so knowing your athletes okay, this athlete's working on this certain thing, how do I connect with that and actually reinforce that pattern that something's going well? Or giving the feedback of like, we're not quite, you know, this is good, but we still need to get elbow catch high or something like that. Um, yeah, any other ideas of how to connect with confidence? I think reflecting on strengths is a really good thing. Like we obviously, we don't want to be positive all the time because that's not realistic. That's not how life is. But being able to reflect on strengths, so knowing that athlete, what they're working on, what their strengths are, how you can um, connect with that, but also having any kind of reflective tool. So I'm not sure if you guys have anything like that, but whether it's after each session, it's it's a good better how reflection of how I'm progressing through this. I'm actually becoming more confident, um, competent and confident in what I'm doing and what I'm changing um, and how I'm going about what I'm doing. Does that make sense? Yeah. Isn't that like someone just like communicating with your athlete after just asking how the session went? Because then yeah. they are looking back at the session. Yeah. Kind of digesting what they did. Yeah. I think as a coach that shows you taking an interest as well. So asking what they think, but I think having it written down, adolescents are very Put it to one side and it's the next thing and it's whatever that information is coming through and we as human beings tend to be quite not always focused on the negative but as soon as something doesn't quite go right we tend to forget a lot of the good stuff that's already been done so having those conversations i think as a coach is really good um but then also getting that own reflection process and then having something they can look back on and go this is how i've demonstrated confidence um yeah, training diary I think is super important and it gets them thinking about themselves and being aware um, because a lot of the time with any of this stuff, awareness is key. How, how am I 
being aware of how I'm, I'm thinking, I'm processing, I'm performing, whatever it is, like any kind of training diary where you're kind of looking at that. Or what was, you know, if you're working with um, adolescents in particular, what's, what's the weekly goal and how am I reflecting on that after each session? So my weekly goal was, I don't know, I'm just sticking with technique. My weekly goal was to work on my catch, okay? After each session, how did I, how did I do that? Was it good? What was good? What was, could be better? How could it be better? Again, it's building that confidence, that autonomy, taking ownership over it, um, and the reward as well, that like weekly goal. Sometimes you have to have a training goal for like each session, the, the carrot that you dangle to get them motivated um, and engaged. Does that make sense? Yeah. I'm just going to say I think the um, the debrief or the training diary or something like that is good to kind of close out the session as well, particularly with like school girls and even like at the elite level. If you don't kind of get it all out, mm. you think about it the entire day and then your whole day revolves around, you know, might, what might not have worked that session or um, that kind of thing. So I think it's good to kind of get it out of the way, have a talk about it, say this is what we'll do next session and just... That, yeah, that I think that that's a really good point. It does kind of wrap up the session. You kind of leave it there. You've got a nice starting point for when you get back there. Um, and if we think about adolescents and their brain and all the information that they're processing, they've got to, you know, go to school. They might have a part-time job. They've got all this friendship stuff, social media. They've got so many things going on in their life that they have to manage. If they're still holding on to that stuff from training, it's good to be able to have that. Okay, this is where I leave it, um, and that's what I find parents um, talk a lot about sport at home. Like sometimes they need some time where they don't talk about sport. So leaving it there. So that's something we talk to parents about a lot. Having a day where you don't talk about it. Also coaching kids that do it. Yes. Yeah, it's it's all consuming. It's and because there's passion there. You do it for a reason. It's, it's not just a job. It's more than just a job. Um, but you do need that. It's the mental recovery as well. Um, yeah, I like that suggestion. Um, yes. I did a thing, so they do a race regionals, I think it's in November or something. Yeah. And when they, on the Tuesday, I met a few of them and I got them to sit down and write what they did, like three points, what they did well, yeah. three points, what they did bad. They filled the bad up like good. that. Yeah. The good took forever. Mm -hmm. And then I got them to write like a goal for a month, three months, yeah. six months. Yes. And I actually made them think about what could I improve in that race. Yeah. In that month. And then you bring it out after the month and it gives them ownership of did I achieve that or yeah. and then we go back to that. Yeah. I think that's awesome because it's like that goal setting and, and everything, it's got to be an ongoing process. It's not like you just get here and then you stop. Um, but it is, you're getting them to reflect and so often it is they can fill up the bad so easily and that's where it's it's good to have that process where you write things down because they have a bad performance in training they'll just remember everything that supports that idea that oh, i'm going really terribly because they've kind of put this lens on finding out any evidence to support the fact that they're not doing well when actually they've had this process where they've done extremely well but they forget about it so it's kind of a nice tool to be able to go back and go hang on a minute look back at all the things that you've done in the last month and all the good stuff and the improvement and the confidence that you've built through that. So yeah, I think that's a really nice way, particularly after competitions. I think it's a nice, you know, that's what you train for. Yeah, being able to reflect. Um, relatedness. So this will build into culture. So that sense of belonging. We all like feeling a part of something. Um, Sport, I think, does a really good job at this. You know, people support the Broncos and you feel a part of something or you feel a part of a squad or you feel part of your family or your, your peer group, whatever it may be. When you're in that, you actually feel what your well-being increases. There's so much research on that. Like I was saying with loneliness before, um, in terms of the, that has physical health effects as well, but being connected with what you do and the people that you do that with is really important. So. If you're thinking about different areas that you work in, so obviously you've got different age groups, you've got an online program, um, some of you online have that rural aspect as well. If we're trying to reach this level of relatedness with your athletes, 
what are some strategies that you can put in place to connect with that relatedness? So how do you create that? People are motivated when they're a part of something that's great. And as a coach, I'm guessing it feels pretty good when you've got a, a group of athletes that are engaged. It's always a, a nice feeling. People are pushing each other. What can you do or what have you found works um, in terms of that relatedness aspect? I think you have to be clear on what you stand for. Yeah. What's your group stand for? Mm. What's your flag? Yeah. People like to march behind a flag. What's yeah. your flag say? Yeah, nice. People connect with that and yep. it's like you, you're in with that. And I think, you know, they're either in, like you said, they're in or they're not. And, you know, your way is not going to be everyone's way, no. but that's okay. But you know, you know what you do find if you really have that strong sense of what you're doing is about. Mm -hmm. Purpose. I, th I think you find that the people that share that are the ones that gravitate to you. Yes. And people come in that they bounce off you if that's not congruent with them. Yeah. I so it, it tends to work out that way. Yeah. People that come in that don't have the same connection mm -hmm. don't tend to maybe stay too long. Yeah. And as a coach, you probably don't want them to stay too long. Because you're trying to build something. Um, knowing your athletes, knowing who they are, knowing who you are as a coach and why you do what you do, why this team is a team, what, you know, all that values and that connection. So something practical is, it can be things even just like a tagline, what you stand for, what does your yeah. squad stand for? Yes. Absolutely. What are the words that describe what your squad stands for? Yeah. So a lot of teams have it like a team vision or team values or whatever it may be. You have a uniform for a reason. You're a part of something. As soon as you get that, that shirt or that swimming cap. So for me, when I, I remember when I was like 14, I made my first national team for my squad. It's like you get the national shirt and the cap with your name on it. It's like I'm a, I'm a part of something. So being able to create that in your squad environment, it's like this actually means something. There's a purpose behind this. Yeah. Anything else that you get? Obviously, we've got some school people. We've got any other groups? Yeah. Um, enforcing buddy systems are saying that okay for two hours or an hour and a half whatever before your race or half an hour after your race you all have to be together yeah but like you do not move anywhere without someone left behind yeah so kind of making sure that everyone's there everyone's included not having one person off sitting by themselves mm. feeling left out yeah and I feel by doing that it kind of builds that trust it's like no matter what goes on here someone's got my back someone's gonna pick me up if I'm not with the group yeah, yeah. Any other ideas of connecting with your athletes in a different setting? You've got adolescents and stuff. You've got a group where you've got girls that are like sometimes friends and sometimes not. How do you build that culture? How do you deal with it? Um, how do I deal with it? <laughs> not sure. Yeah, I sort of just go with the flow. Yeah. Day. Um, but when you can, you can sort of tell if some are down or some are up change a certain session or create it more fun. Yeah. Make it more fun and it brings when more fun they connect and yeah. And they connect their be more close and yeah. Yeah, sort of yeah, fun. Fun. It's make it fun and they'll connect. Exactly. Through games it's like it kind of is it's really good. You have to get creative sometimes but you get that very creative. Um, you get that impulsivity and that reward, there's something fun there. So it's like, okay, there's a purpose why I'm at training. Um, but it does, like, that always connects people. So, you know, at the end of the, the session, if you have relays or if you've got some game or some some team against team or something, it, it's building that connection. And you know, with mass starts. Sorry? Mass starts. Mass starts. <laughs> In the pool. Yeah. And how does that go normal uh, with your group? Oh, yeah, it's fun. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah. Fun as a coach as well, I'm sure. Um, yeah, it's finding those things. And um, those games are multi-purpose in terms of all of this kind of stuff. Um, yeah, just anything that you can do to build relatedness. And obviously, the next workshop that we do will be based around that in terms of building a squad culture. What does that, what does that look like? How do you do it? Bringing in some of the things that you're already doing, but also um, building upon that as well. Anything else that you want to share around relatedness or we've got a few more minutes? Any other ideas or things? 
um, kind of in the more long-term well-being of that athlete if yeah. they are at a state, national, which is heavily involved level. Also making sure that you do ask them questions about what they do outside of that, yes. like friends, family, because at one point in time, sooner or later, they will not be competing anymore, mm -hmm. which can be very frightening, a real big shock to the system if all of a sudden they're out of that really close-knit environment and kind of left mm -hmm. floating without a support network to go back into. Yeah, absolutely. Or have been a part of for years. Yeah, I think that's um, building that connection, coach, athlete, getting to know them as a person, not just an athlete like um, you were saying before. But yeah, that, that identity, identity does get very tied up in the sport and what you do, um, which is good because, you know, you get the outcomes. But when it does end, there is that sense of loneliness. I don't have that, that connection or sense of belonging with something that had purpose and meaning to me. And then all of a sudden, they're not connected to anything. And that's when, you know, it's pretty well documented how some athletes in particular struggle as they transition out of sport. So... The relatedness is great, but then also, like you said, having that other stuff, knowing what else they have in their life to connect with. Um, yeah, it's a it's a massive one. Yeah. All right. So, I don't know what I've got left. Oh, just briefly talking about motivation. We've kind of spoken a lot about it. Um, slide's so jumpy. But A, motivation is where you don't really have anything. If we're thinking about self-determination theory and those three core principles, those needs that we need, that we have as humans. Um, a, motivation, your needs aren't really met. You're not really engaged in a task or activity. External motivation is good. I'm not saying you shouldn't have it at all. Um, you're motiva motivated by rewards, external factors, systems, all that kind of stuff. Still really great in terms of getting performance, but in regards to self-determination theory, your needs aren't always met by that. Um, because self-determination is the self. So why you do what you do, you're motivated by those intrinsic things. So curiosity, growth, mastery, fun, personal satisfaction, connection, all of those kind of things, you get that intrinsic motivation, whereas you actually get that drive, um, generally get a better performance, all of that as well. So just being able to connect with those things. So normally I'd give a bit of reflection time um, you don't have to do it, but I think being, you know, we're practicing what we preach to our athletes and ways of um, them reflecting on what they're doing. So if you learn anything today, hopefully you learned something, but if you didn't, that's okay too. Um, but what did I learn today? Um, how could this information help me in my role as a coach? So thinking about, okay, this is how I'm connecting with my athletes at the moment. How can I understand them better? How can I understand myself better as a coach? And how can we bring those things together? Um, and what specifically can you put into practice? Obviously, some of these suggestions that we've had and, you know, having one-on-one -on -one meetings every month might not be feasible. You guys have got a lot of stuff on as a coach. Like, you can't always sit down and have hour meetings with everyone. But what are some ways of how you can touch base, have those conversations with your athletes, give them a bit of ownership, um, help them reflect and build their own competence through um, conversation um, and just that connection. If we're thinking about relatedness, if you're spending that, that time with your athlete, they're going to feel connected to you and connected to the program as well. So um, I encourage you to write them down or just have a think in your own time. Um, yeah, so we've finished a little bit early. Um, I'm welcome for feedback. Obviously, this is the first time we've done something like this. Um, and obviously, some of you are familiar with some of the content. Some of it may have been new. Nice starting point, I think, to kind of build on towards the next workshop. Do you guys have any questions about anything or feedback at all? Very practical presentation. From my point Thank you. I think the rediscussion, you guys, all come from different backgrounds and different contexts as well. It's good to have the theory, but also you guys reflecting on how you put it into practice and getting some ideas from each other as well. Any other questions or comments? Good. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for showing up. Yeah. Thank you. Don't really. Yeah. It's easy to go through the motions. Yeah. And yeah. yeah.
Yeah. And if you think neuroplasticity as a coach, your brain gets wired in a certain way to do things a certain way. So being able to, you know, go through that stage of change yourself and how am I going to change my behavior as a coach to know my athletes better, create those new pathways. Yeah. The other thing is, is that you're potentially coaching athletes older, I'm potentially coaching athletes younger. The brains are wired considerably differently, right? So, yes. you know, it's a challenge for me to make sure I'm trying to think how those younger athletes will think to get some of their performance because they just by virtue of their age and generation, mm. they think and process and, and just everything is very different. Yeah, absolutely. To their, their world. Age different just because of development, but then I think with this social media and technology stuff coming in, it's just it's a whole nother beast. Um, yeah, and if you think back to when you were an adolescent, you're like, no, you just put in, you dug in, you did the work, whatever, but now it's like there's all these other variables at play as well. Any other questions at all? I've got my details up there. I'll stick around for a bit if you want to ask me anything, but feel free to email me or get in contact and answer anything you have. Thank you um, so much, Chelsea, and for everyone who joined us online and here today as well. Um, yeah, I, I really, I don't know about you guys, but I found it, we really stripped back all the noise that's out there about knowing your athlete and all of these things that you have to be doing. So it was great to see these models, and I don't know about you guys, but there was a lot of aha uh -huh moments in there as well. Um, so thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much for that, and hopefully we've all got something to take away or think about um, moving forward as well and I'm really excited for the next one to see how we can link performance and culture as well so it'll awesome. be really exciting. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Thanks very for much. the opportunity. Thank you. Please eat. <laughs> yes, eat. <laughs>